Welcome public inventors. Uh, this video is a real treat for me. I'm very excited about this. I'm going to announce and hopefully demonstrate and explain uh, something that I think is a true invention. I think it's actually novel and has never been done before. Uh, of course, the internet is very good at telling you if you're wrong, so if anyone has seen something like this before, please make me uh, aware of it. Uh, I call this the turret joint. Um, this is a new kind of joint which allows multiple members to come together in a single point, which is necessary for the GLUS robot project, which I am working on. The parts you see here before you have all been, or most of them have been 3D printed. Uh, it took me quite a while to get them done, and I'd like to uh, explain the purpose of, of the joint. So this is a example of the joint which has three members coming into it. You can imagine a member like this, which is a carbon fiber tube, which might be connected to my GLUS pusher uh, or to a commercial competitive. This one is from Fergelli, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit in a minute. And it basically consists of uh, a few parts. It consists of a ball, which fits in a rotor or in a lock and rotors like this peg which fit into the lock uh, but have a disc which cannot um, allow the object to escape once it is locked together. Once it is in place the hole in which the rotor exists allows it a certain amount of motion which of course is necessary for the kind of robot that I want to build. So the beauty of this is that multiple members come together and always focus on a single point, which in this case is the, the center of the ball. And of course, the ball is a hemisphere, so it's the, the top of this object. And are allowed to rotate within certain limits within um, this space. So if you imagine uh, these being connected either to this actuator or to my actuator, and those actuators pushing and pulling on the object around like this, you can see that it's free to move within certain limits. Now, of course, you cannot move it completely. That is, you can't move this all the way around without changing the joint. Um, the reason this is necessary is to build omnitriangulated robots the way uh, we would like to do. You, of course, have to have a joint which allows a certain amount of movement. Now, there are ball and socket joints and other joints which allow movement, but none of them uh, keep the rods focused on the center of the point. So the idea here is that um, these rotors, here's a, a different one that's small, which ha it's, you see it has a spherical disc inside it, is always pressed against the ball so that any force this way is actually um, very strongly supported. As you can see, the little peg inside here, which holds it, is relatively small, and a very strong person could probably break this off by putting side force on it. However, the omnitriangulated robot is incapable of developing any side force or torque because all it's doing is pushing this way on um, members which are free to rotate about the ball. So I believe it will be structurally a very powerful joint. Now, um, those of you who are familiar with some of the work about Mr. Fuller or geometry in general may appreciate this version, which uses a different cap. Um, you can see these are really the same rotors, except this has a higher cap on it, and I call this the six-hole cap. And this, um, which I think is actually quite a beautiful object, um, allows six objects or six members to come into a point from a plane. So this would be sort of a snowflake like shape and the three tetrahedral points below it. Technically speaking, you can also make this object. You'd have to put a ball inside there to lock it uh, as a 12 member object that would have 12 pegs around it. So instead of using uh, this cap here, I would replace it with a second rotor. And the rotor simply screw together with these little bolting flanges. Now, um, the actual geometry here, of course, can be changed. There's no reason you have to use this, but for technical purposes, this is the cuboctahedron uh, shape. That is, if you, if you put uh, both rotors together and you looked at um, the members coming out of each of the holes, the shape is called a cuboctahedron. And the reason this is particularly valuable is because 
it's a way to fill space and tile um, the surface with triangles that all have members of the same length. Um, that was something that um, Buckminster Fuller created when he created the octet truss um, structure. So what we are attempting to do here is to build a moving octet truss, so, or to build a truss that allows something to move. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, to build large robots that are not extremely heavy and massive, but are still large, although ephemeral and airy, the way you do that is the way you build anything. Uh, and if you look at space frames at airports or the trusses and roof systems, you'll see that people use triangular members to get strength without adding too much weight. And of course, that is what we are attempting to do. The um, innovation here is that we're allowing them to move. Now, you could, of course, build this object with three separate ball and socket joints. But if you did that, this small triangle in here, which you would try to make as small as possible by putting the balls as close together, would actually represent a fourth member. That is, the two things coming in here would not focus together on a point, so they would no longer really be a triangle. They'd really be two members with a short member between them, which would allow a degree of freedom. So you would not be able to know precisely where things are. And if you push on this one, you'd end up sort of twisting this one uh, if, if you use the, the three, um, three ball and socket joints. So the reason this is an innovation is that I don't believe anyone has ever created a joint which allows multiple members to come together, which keep all the members focused on a single point, which is very important from a structural point of view. So this is a system, and as everything um, that we do uh, at Public Invention uh, is, it's open source. Um, uh, the file to generate all of these shapes, here's an example of 3D printing um, a number of these rotors. I haven't broken the supports off yet. This is the way you print multiples at a time. Uh, is available via a program called OpenSCAD, which is a parametric modeling system. It's on the GitHub site right now, and I'm going to put this at Thingiverse. Now, um, this uh, is being made freely available. In a sense, this is an open hardware invention. Anyone is free to manufacture and use this as they want. The one thing you're not free to do is to patent it. Because, first of all, since I'm now publicly disclosing it, that would be fraudulent and illegal, and in the third place, it would make me mad. So don't do that. Uh, th that is, you can use this in any way as long as you do not attempt to create a monopoly and prevent other people from using it. So <clears throat> the balls have a little set of pegs, and if you're familiar with 3D printing, you can probably imagine I don't have this quite right. I have to actually sand these down a little bit to get them to fit. Uh, but they fit together with the caps, if you put enough pressure on it, um, so that this is a system in the sense that you can choose either to make two balls, which would go into um, the full rotor, you can make the um, nine-member joint, or you can make the three-member joint. Um, now, uh, just to, to show something kind of fun, I initially prototyped this as a very small scale, which I rep rec uh, recommend for 3D printing because it, it's a lot faster. So here's an itty-bitty cute one. See how small and cute it is? And one of the lovely things about OpenSCAD is since the whole thing is parametric, you can change the size of all of this very easily. Um, so, for example, if we started to build really big things where our member, instead of being approximately a foot long, was, let's say, three feet long or four feet long, we might have to make this joint a little larger. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, so here is a system, uh, which this is also part of the release program. This, I call this a tubular mount. This is simply a system with a little hole in it, which allows you to put a carbon fiber rod in here. This is standard... Um, quarter inch inner diameter uh, rod, a quarter inch inner diameter because my glass pusher uses magnets in, inside there. And so if you were to use this locked into the system here and then put screws in here, you would have a certain amount of mobility. You could use this as a construction system. That is, you can imagine you know, a uh, tetrahedra stacked together, tiling the, the whole plane here. Um, and you could build something that would be very strong because even though it's loose, once you turn it into a tetrahedra, it's not going to be able to go anywhere. Um, 
And that is much simpler, of course, than trying to use linear actuators to build a robot. So in a sense, this could simply be considered a space frame construction system in which the parts happen to be 3D printed and allow a certain amount of non-regularity. Now, if you were going to build a perfectly regular, perfectly flat uh, space frame, you wouldn't need this because all of the joints would be exactly the same and there would be no reason to allow this motion. Um, however, if you chose to build, say, a barrel vault, that is something with curvature to shed water or to be extra strong to support weight this way, then necessarily you're not dealing with equilateral triangles and you have to have a certain amount of change. Well, it would be very difficult to um, design each of these joints with a slight different uh, angle to support that, whereas this you would use exactly the same joint in all cases and the rod would simply go in at a slightly different angle depending on, on where you are. So this can be considered a construction system independent of the idea of building robots, which is something that I am working on. Now, as you guys may recall, uh, back here we have the Gluss Pusher, which I've been working on, which is a linear actuator which is designed to be less expensive than commercial linear actuators. However, that work was going rather slowly. Um, I still think it's, it's useful because it's possible that this will be far cheaper than what I'm holding here. However, this is a Fergelli L16 linear actuator, and I have to say it's excellent. It cost $80, which is rather unfortunate, because we need 20 or 30 of these to make a Gluss robot that's going to be very impressive. Um, but it is a, um, a wonderful device within the parameters that it, it is meant to work. Um, you'll notice that I have printed 3D rotors that fit the end caps, and, and getting the end caps to fit was harder than it might look. So I would like to say to the form for Gelly, uh, your machine is excellent, but your CAD drawings suck. Um, you could perhaps improve that. Anyway, this actuator is very nice, very forceful, provides about 50 newtons of force, um, which is uh, about 10 kilograms of force, or no, five, I'm sorry, five kilograms. So it's strong enough that it would be very hard to stop its motion uh, at 12 volts with just your hand. I probably could do it, but it would require all of my strength um, to do it. Um, it's also nicely compact. Of course, the power supply has to be provided separately, and it also doesn't come with a controller. So when you think about adding power and a controller to each member, this $80 is really quite expensive when you add those, those other things in. So that is a problem. But I want to experiment with both of those, and of course, um, there's no reason, if you have the money, not to use this. Um, I may succeed someday in building a cheaper linear actuator, or I may not. We'll, we'll see about that. Um, but uh, I wanted to make progress on the rest of the robot machinery, which is something that, that I feel like I've done here, and so I'm announcing this. Um, and I hope to put all of this at Thingiverse soon, where it will be easy for people to play with it as well. Um, now let me just return to the Fergelli uh, linear actuator. This is a lead screw type linear actuator, which means that Inside here, there's a lead screw turned by a strong uh, rotary motor in here. The, the motor is very small, but electric motors can, can operate if they're geared down at a very high RPM, which makes them very efficient. So this comes out to about here. It has a stroke of 140 millimeters. Now, let me explain the limited motion here. I designed the size of this hole precisely to support a change in triangles that matches what I expect to manufacture. Um, I have not yet published that mathematics. Um, it's in a spreadsheet right now. I will publish it eventually. The basic problem is um, if you're building this out of linear actuators, let's take this one. This one has a ratio of extended length to closed length of slightly greater than 1.5, okay? Um, and it would be very hard to build one that got closer to two because as you do so, it, mechanically it becomes harder because the end tends to wobble away from here and it do doesn't have enough mechanical support. So any simple linear actuator is going to have a ratio of extended length to shortened length um, of something significantly less than two. And I think 1.5 is a good engineering compromise. Well, if you imagine these two points on a triangle and you mad and the bottom point 
was allowed to spread out, let's say, 10 feet, well, this wouldn't support it because the, it can't become that obtuse. But you can't build such a device anyway. Um, so using the ratio of 1.5, and I've worked out all the mathematics so you could put in a different ratio, um, we can see that this circle will support it even if these two sides are as short as possible and the bottom is as long as possible, which makes the most obtuse triangle, most obtuse angle here that you can, or I should say least acute angle. Or if the two um, sides coming into the joint are as long as possible and the bottom piece is as short as possible, and that would squeeze these points together as closely as possible. Now, um, it is not possible to support, for example, 1.8 um, in all configurations. Why? Well, it's fairly easy to see. As these get closer together, eventually the disc will hit in the middle. So you, you have certain constraints. You cannot allow the discs to hit each other. Otherwise, there's no point in the hole being there. You can't go that far. And then, of course, as you go in the extreme, there's nothing really to hit in this case, but the peg has to hit, hit the hole. Well, you could make the hole bigger, but at that point, you have to make the disc bigger to keep it locked into the hole. So there is always a certain limitation on the angles that you can support here. Uh, so there's probably more to discuss about that, but I would like to keep this video relatively short. Anyway, this is an invention which I call the turret joint. I think it's going to be pretty significant for the construction of large space frames or large light space frames and the kind of gloss robots which I would like to build either out of my own in, uh, linear actuator or commercial linear actuators. Thank you very much. Um, remember, if you would like to contribute in some way, send me an email. Everything we do is open source. I would love to be thought of as the coach of the public invention team, but right now I don't have anyone to coach. Uh, the, the public invention is just me, and I would really like to change that. Um, there are many, many interesting um, problems to be addressed. Uh, those of you who are interested in 3D printing, one would be instead of making this a hemisphere, make this something smaller so that a robot tool could be placed exactly at that point. So that you could, for example, put an extruder at that point and then move the object around and thereby build a 3D printer based on this principle. Or, for example, put a cutting or grinding tool so that you could move around uh, a piece of marble or something and grind it or a piece of wood and, and cut away material to uh, form something uh, or to add sensors or, or so forth. Um, there's also plenty of work to be done um, in a structural engineering point of view to perhaps improve this joint. I don't claim that this way of mounting these carbon pegs is absolutely the best way to do that. Um, and soon I will implement the control that turns this into a simple 2D robot, and then you start to get into a lot of programming and computer uh, science type problems of how do you actually control this when this is attached to um, a rotor here. How do you actually control this so that the point down here goes exactly where you want? It's an interesting problem, not necessarily a research problem, but certainly an interesting problem. So again, thank you very much. This is Robert L. Reed. Uh, demonstrating and announcing for the first time what I hope is an invention. I will be pleased to learn that someone has already invented it, which is possible, um, uh, which I call the turret joint based on ideas by Buckminster Fuller on the cuboctahedral structure for building octet trusses. Thank you.